Okay, hello everyone. I'm going to get started with just a few notes um, before this presentation as people start trickling in. Um, so my name is Isabel from Wisconsin Land and Water and thank you for joining us today. Uh, Wisconsin Land and Water is a 501c3 um, nonprofit that works to really support the efforts of land conservation departments and land conservation committees throughout the state. And we do that in a variety of ways, such as standards, policy, um, doing outreach, and what brings everybody here together is trainings, um, which is my role of helping to organize these things. Um, so I'm really happy to have you all here. I have just a few more notes um, is that one, as you just heard before I started speaking, I am recording this webinar and it will be posted on the Wisconsin Land and Water website at some point in the near future. And then I will also be sending it um, a link for that when it is available uh, as an email to everybody who registered as well as a, a link to an evaluation. Um, we are going to be taking questions throughout the presentation through the chat line, which is on that bottom bar, and you can submit a question at any time, um, and we'll get to as many of them answered at the end as we can. Otherwise, we're also going to have a follow-up email um, with some answers to the remaining ones. So today, our presentation will be on winter plant identification and pollinator habitat. And our presenter is Laura Jacques Smith, um, who is the Wisconsin NRCS partner liaison with Par Pollinator Partnership. And she'll talk a little bit more about what Pollinator Partnership is. The last note that I have right before I let Laura take it away is that this presentation is also very image heavy. So if you need to have the screen, the presentation be a little bit larger. I'd recommend just toggling it a little bit um, bigger. And you can do that in the space that's kind of between the presentation PowerPoint and the image, uh, well, the video that um, Laura of Laura. So you'll be able to just move it a little bit larger um, if you need to see anything. But I think with that, I am all done. So without any further ado, please, Laura, take it away. Okay, hi everyone. Um, thank you all so much for coming today. I hope you're all staying safe and cozy amongst the weather that we're having. Um, I'm really blown away by how many people were interested in winter botany. Um, I wasn't anticipating so much interest. So this is great. I guess we're all kind of anxious for botanizing again. Um, and or maybe more of you are out in the winter than I realized and hence your interest or you're maybe excited to get started with it. So um, a little bit about um, Pollinator Partnership to start out um, or P2 as we call ourselves. Um, we are a science-based nonprofit conservation organization with the goal of providing protection for pollinators and <laughs> their ecosystems. Um, and considering our mission to promote the health of pollinators, our programs work to create habitats, support research in pollinator conservation, and promote stewardship through outreach. Um, one of our uh, biggest programs that you might be familiar with is Pollinator Week which starts on June 20th this year. Um, I have to update the logo here <laughs> um, for the new pollinator week that's coming up this year. Um, so that's a great time to attend pollinator events or maybe create your own pollinator event. Um, but do check out our website sometime. We have a lot of other programs like Bee Friendly Farming, Bee Friendly Gardening, and a whole bunch of resources. Okay, so um, to kind of get right into it, um, I was honestly a little bit over ambitious probably to, uh, with what I all wanted to cover today because once I started adding my plants, it was really hard to decide which ones to keep um, and uh, which ones to toss out in only an hour. It's hard to get to all the species I'd like to, um, but kind of think of today's webinar as an introduction and hopefully we'll give you some, um, this will give you some confidence or uh, make you a little bit more ambitious to get out during the winter months and uh, know what you're looking at. I've tried to select some species that are more common, um, also the ones that you're more likely to see in winter um, if you're doing a site assessment. But just given the, the time limit we have, there's a whole lot that we won't get to today that I'd love to get to. Um, but, um, and then 
a quick word about um, plant ID guides. Um, there are so many great resources out there, and so these are just a few of my favorite ones. Um, if you're only going to pick one, I would pick this Wildflowers of Wisconsin and the Great Lakes region for wildflowers. Um, just the way it's set up and the pictures are great. If you're here for the trees and shrubs, um, this good old Michigan Trees and Michigan Shrubs and Vines, um, this is the book that I um, had in college 15 years ago, and it's still, I think, one of the best resources. Um, and then this Prairie Seedling uh, an Evaluation Guide, it's kind of short and sweet. There's not a ton of species in it, but the, the seedling guide is definitely helpful. But um, there is a lot of information on establishment and evaluation in here that I think is really helpful. Um, and this is also free. This is a, a PDF guide that's available. Um, I put the website right here if you're interested in looking at it. Um, and then here's some useful online resources. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but um, just to point them out and you kind of have them as reference. Um, and I also, I should have mentioned too that um, the slides today I can make available um, as a PDF to everyone um, if you're registered. So this will come out in an email with the um, follow-up Q&A. So don't feel like you have to write all this stuff down. Um, uh, you'll have a copy of the slides afterwards. Um, but I do want to point out um, this Illinois Wildflowers website and the Minnesota Wildflowers are just excellent websites. They're two of my favorite. I reference them a lot. They have such great pictures and descriptions. Um, and in fact, there is quite a few pictures um, from this Minnesota Wildflowers uh, website that I use today. Um, and yeah, that's uh, Peter and Katie from Minnesota Wildflowers um, that you'll see their picture credit in quite a few of the pictures. Um, I also have some pictures from Matt Smith. He's um, a director of conservation at River Edge. And I just wanna put a plug in for them. They have a winter ID and management of woody species class every year. And it is just excellent um, for learning your, our, your woody species. It's already passed this year, but keep an eye out for it next year because they pretty much do it every year. And I know there's other in-person workshops too, like the UWM Field Station has one. Um, I think the McKenzie Center has one going on today, in fact. <laughs> um, and so, you know, they're definitely around. They, um, you know, just keep a lookout. Um, and then I want to point out this winter botany, a YouTube video put out by Eric Fusler from um, Arkansas. And uh, some of the plants are not relevant uh, here in Wisconsin because they're, you know, Arkansas is pretty far south. But there are um, some great introductions to, uh, you know, learning your twig and bud um, components. And he does a great job uh, looking for a variety of clues for winter ID, like bark, twigs, fruits, and leaves. So if you're new to if you're new to winter plant ID, this is kind of a good introduction. And then here are some um, two books that are pretty good, um, that, some great illustrations and pictures. Um, and then I just wanted to point out, um, UW Stevens Point has this uh, leaf winter tree ID. Uh, that's a PDF download again, and is a great um, introductory key if you're just learning um, how to do winter uh, bud ID on twigs. Okay, so I'm going to be referring to various standard botanical descriptive terms today, um, but don't worry if you're not already familiar with these or feel like you're struggling to, to keep up with them. Um, these reference charts are available for download, you know, anywhere. Um, usually your plant ID book is going to come with some sort of reference chart. Um, and so I'm just going to go over a few terms today briefly but um, know that you can always reference back to this. Um, and quite honestly, I, I'm not a botanist, I'm more of an ecologist, and so I don't always use the correct terminology either, but it is good to learn um, and you know, use them for being uh, accurate with your descriptions. Um, but oftentimes learning a plant, you kind of come up with like your own ways of describing a plant. And so some of these terms, you know, won't even be relevant to you, but um, for the sake of today, I'm gonna go over a few of them. Um, when thinking about leaf attachments, a petiole is a term that is used often, and that's the structure that connects the leaf to the stem. So um, here, this, this plant has a petiole. Here, the leaf is sessile, or sometimes they call it stalkless. Um, some of the plants today, we have a clasping leaf, and this is when the, the leaf actually kind of like wraps around the stem or it like clasps onto the stem a little bit. Um, for leaf um, arrangements, Opposite are when the leaves go up the stem like this, just like it sounds, the leaves are opposite of each other um, 
across the stem, uh, like milkweeds and oxeye sunflower. Um, if you have an alternate leaf uh, pattern, then they're zigzag like this up the stem, zigzag pattern. Um, or a world pattern, the leaves are just like it sounds, kind of whirled around the stem. So there'll be sometimes like three, four, five leaves in a world pattern. Um, and then another good term to know is compound leaves or like a leaflet. Um, that's when the leaf is actually a little uh, a branch of more leaves. And sometimes you can have um, uh, something called twice compounded or pinnately compounded. And that's when the compound leaf has compound leaves. <laughs> um, and then for uh, leaf shapes, there's so many different leaf shapes. Um, but uh, ovate looks kind of a teardrop shape. That's a good one to know, or you know, more like lanceolate, kind of like a, a lance or a spear, palmate, like your palm. Um, for leaf margins, there is smooth, there is toothed, very lobed. Um, you know, it's kind of a gradient of the, and that kind of gives you a sense of the texture of the leaf too. Um, and some one other word that comes up sometimes is perfoliate that's an that's when opposite leaves are joined around the stem that kind of looks like they're actually connected around the stem uh, like in cup plant okay and then usually i have the parts of a flower diagram here but for winter botany we don't even need to have that um because all the flowers are gone by now um so i have this slide up here just to look more at the different structures of the inflorescence because in winter the inflorescence is really what stands out and can help you with IDing the plants. So while the flowers are gone, the skeleton of the inflorescence or the form of the flower is still apparent. So for example, when all the flowers are gone, you might still be able to tell that the uh, florets were arranged in an umbel. Um, sometimes the umbel can kind of have another umbel um, or umblets as they call them. Um, or a lot of our asters are a composite flower and which is comprised of both disc flowers, that's the center flowers, and then the ray flowers are what's attached to these petals here. The composite flower is actually a flower made up of a whole bunch of tiny flowers. Um, and in winter, all these petals, of course, have fallen off and you're kind of just left with the um, remaining globular uh, spiky uh, of what's left of the, uh, the disc flower. So, um, these, these terms are good to know, and these shapes are good uh, descriptors to know uh, when you're doing winter botany. Okay, so on to some of the species. Um, I'm going to go over some of the common species that are put into CRP and pollinator mixes in Wisconsin. And this is nowhere near exhaustive, but I just selected some based on their visibility in winter and also some that are just really good to get familiar with because of their importance to pollinators. And for these, I'm going to be very brief um, showing them in summer, too, just because with forbs especially, it's really helpful to know the plant in summer. And that, that gives you a lot of the um, key identifying characteristics to be able to identify them in winter. So for those of you who took my summer uh, plant ID workshop, this might be a little bit of review, um, or maybe some of you know these already. So think of it as good review um, to know the the winter ones. And if you don't know them yet, then I'm going to be going through them awfully fast, but know that you can always go back and reference them, of course. Um, okay. And I also, it killed me to take out some of the early spring blooming ones, um, like Golden Alexander and Spiderwort, but honestly, they are so difficult to see in winter. A lot of our early spring blooms, not surprisingly, those flowers, um, those plants just senesce and they decompose and they're very difficult to find in winter. I was able to find some of them, but more because I knew where they were, knew where to look. But if I were out in a new field, honestly, a lot of those plants are just so difficult to find. So the plants that I'm, I'm presenting today are you're more likely to actually be able to see um, uh, in a site assessment. All right, so the first one is penstemon or foxglove beard tongue. Um, it's a really early bloomer um, and can grow up to about three feet tall. And this is one that definitely persists into winter because of its leaves and um, it's kind of like uh, seed capsules here. Um, I want you to notice though how the leaves are opposite on the stem. They're a little bit toothed, but these leaves are still gonna stick around into winter. Um, and 
the seed heads are very distinctive and take on kind of a reddish hue. And some of you who are familiar with this plant might know that it also has a very unique smell to it. It has like, if you're in a field with a bunch of penstemon, it has this kind of like almost musky smell. I can't say it's a good smell. It's, um, I mean, the flowers are great when they're blooming, but once you have the seed capsules here, they, they just have kind of a bit of an odd smell. Um, but because of their kind of bright red hue, you oftentimes can see them um, even from far away. So here, here's one kind of sticking out in the prairie. They're not too tall, but because of their um, that seed capsule there, it's very noticeable. Um, so there's these clusters of upright seed capsules, um, and the reddish hues kind of turn mostly brown by now in winter. Um, and the penstemon is also likely to have the weaves still attached. Um, the plant retains um, some leaves and not always if you're in a really high windy area they might fall off but i noticed that this species oftentimes has a couple leaves still attached and um, you can still see that opposite pattern and then also penstemon is a little bit unique in that it attains some um, basil rosettes um, that are often kind of keep their kind of greenish or like a reddish purplish hue during the winter months um, which is kind of neat and you don't want to take this mistake it for like english plantain which is a common weed but this is actually uh, part of the penstemon Okay, so we probably all know milkweed. It's a very common uh, plant, pollinator plant, growing in many different environments. It loves disturbance, which is why it's associated with fields and roadsides. Oftentimes, it's even growing up in like regularly mowed trails. It just, um, you know, almost likes to be cut. <laughs> um, so here it is growing up in the spring. Here's those distinctive leaves. Monarchs uh, feed exclusively on milkweed uh, foliage. Here's a nice monarch cat. And here is those big uh, uh, globular uh, pinkish blooms. Um, they're earlier blooming and usually are done blooming about by the end of July. Um, they can grow pretty big, especially like a more established stand, about six and a half feet tall even. Um, leaf arrangement is opposite, which is important to note, and stems produce that milky sap. Um, and here they are starting kind of when they're just before they're getting ripe. Um, the fruit are kind of plump tear shaped pods, have a warty surface, and they kind of go from a light green to more of like a gold gray brown when they're ripe. Um, the seed pods kind of crack open when the seeds get ripe. And then here you can see these uh, seed pods are definitely ripe. Um, and they have that really flat kind of large brown seed and um, these little wispies uh, that blow away in the wind. Um, so this is late fall, um, and by winter time, usually they look more like this. Um, the casings will kind of be open, grayish black on the outsides, and mottled kind of white on the insides. I mean, honestly, they're still very distinctive as milkweed, and sometimes some of those um, little white seed parachutes there will still be hanging on. They kind of get snagged on some of the ve vegetation sometimes. And so milkweed is one of those plants where if you're driving by, you can even spot it, you know, on the highway, kind of going past a clump or something just because it's so distinctive. Um, and one thing to note, though, is that the leaves pretty much always fall off. The leaves do not stick around. And so you pretty much just have um, this tall stem with some of the pods that stick on. All right, so swamp milkweed is similar to common milkweed, but as its name implies, it prefers moist soils and can be found near bodies of water, and wet meadows and prairies. Um, it grows pretty tall again, about six feet, and has more of a reddish stem. The leaves are opposite and a lot more narrow and lance-shaped compared to the other milkweeds, and oftentimes are a lot darker. Um, and the magenta flower turns um, into a smooth tear-dropped, um, seed pod that's at the very top of the plant. And then going into fall, those leaves kind of turn a yellowish reddish color before they eventually drop. Um, so here it is fall, a little bit more early winter. Um, and again, the seed pods oftentimes stick on. I mean, if you're in a really high wind area, I suppose they might fall off. Um, the leaves are definitely off. The plant, it looks a little ragged, but these uh, seed pods that are hanging on are just, you know, kind of your giveaway here. Um, here's one in late winter. This was just taken a couple of weeks ago. Those seed pods are still hanging on to the tips. And you'll notice that here, the seed pods are only on the tips of the plant. That's um, indicative of the swamp milkweed. 
Um, World milkweed is definitely my favorite just because it's so delicate and monarch caterpillars look like giants when they're trying to feed on the little needle-like leaves. Um, it's found in prairies, forest openings, roadsides, old fields, somehow manages to grow within cool season grass stands sometimes. I've seen a lot of world milkweed growing amongst a whole bunch of smooth brome. Um, so it is a little bit more of a conservative species, but also can um, compete well and fend for itself in um, places you might not expect. Um, but it grows from a very slender single stem, and they're only about one to three feet tall, so they're pretty small. Um, and you can e easily distinguish them by their leaves, which are very narrow. And when you're in shape, and as the name suggests, they are whirled around the stem. Um, the seed pod, the seeds look very similar to your other milkweeds, except the, the seed pods are just very, very thin and slender. Um, and this is one of our latest blooming milkweeds. Um, oftentimes they're flowering the end of the summer, even into fall. And, um, and then so they go to seed, you know, for in like, you know, mid mid fall oftentimes, sometimes early. It depends on how site, uh, how sunny the site is probably. Um, but by winter time, just like the other milkweeds, the leaves are completely gone. So you just have a bare stem here. And here are the pods still hanging on. Sometimes a few seeds get caught up. Um, but here is a site where it was a lot of smooth brome in the background. So the smooth brome kind of gets lodged or kind of like forms a mat. And here these milkweeds are standing up nice and tall and straight. Um, and they just, you know, this was just taken a few weeks ago. So, you know, through most of the winter months, they're still standing tall. So I've noticed that um, milkweeds are actually kind of in a bizarre way, almost easier to spot in winter sometimes because milkweeds, um, especially if they're kind of surrounding in a matrix of other green vegetation, it's almost kind of easy to miss unless you're doing like a transect or quadrats or something, you know, specifically doing species ID. But if you're just doing kind of a walkthrough or scanning a field, I think milkweed can actually be kind of easy to miss sometimes if you're not catching it right in the bloom time. Um, and so winter is actually a really good time to go scout for um, how much milkweed you have on your property. Okay, um, so pale purple coneflower belongs to the aster family. It has these composite seed heads. And so it's actually a composite of a bunch of tiny individual flowers, the edges being the ray flowers and the center being the disc flowers. Um, the pollen is white and blooms in June and July, so it's another early bloomer. Um, the thing I want you to notice with pale purple is that it has this elongated stem. The leaves are usually only at the bottom two thirds of the plant um, and have, they have these like very lance shaped leaves. Um, and that persists into winter. So here's that, um, that kind of spiky uh, looking cone head that persists. These will stick around all winter. And a lot of these leaves are still there. You can see how hairy they are. You can see how thin they are. They, they definitely curl up, but you can imagine what they look like once you stretch them out. And compare those leaves with the leaves of purple coneflower. Uh, if you know this plant, you'll know that it has uh, this more ovate shaped leaf um, and the leaves go much farther up the stem. Um, and purple coneflower is sometimes a little bit contentious here in Wisconsin. It is a, a little bit out of range to be native here. Um, so I would not use purple coneflower if you are planting something next to a remnant site or a very sensitive site. Um, but if you're just looking at improving a habitat site, purple coneflower is often a good option um, as long as you're getting it from a reputable nursery. Don't ever get some of those like weird cultivars like sunset orange or something like that. You know, get something that's uh, closest to the native version. Um, but uh, for winter, the, they kind of turn almost like a black color, but they're very apparent um, in the matrix of brown grasses and those leaves are oftentimes still stuck on. So you can see that ovate shape, they go up the stem so you can easily distinguish it from the pale purple. Okay, purple and white prairie clovers. They're very nectar rich flowers that are a favorite of a lot of pollinators. And these are in the legume family. So they're also loved by rabbits. So if you have a very small pollinator planting, you might not see them stick around for very long because they get chomped up by rabbits. Um, but the thimble shaped flower gives this plant away. Um, it kind of almost looks like it might be a compound or like a, um, a composite, but these are, you know, all little irregularly shaped flowers. Um, the plants are also very short in stature. They're usually only about one to two feet and have multiple stems from the base. The stems are unbranched, hairless, and slightly rigid. And so those uh, qualities of the stem kind of persist into the winter. 
Um, all the leaves have fallen off in winter time, but the seed heads still stick around and are um, pretty easy. You can still see that kind of uh, thimble shaped flower head. Sometimes um, the seeds fall off or they're eaten. And so then they kind of have this white kind of like sword like look um, off the black stem. And so depending what time of year um, you might just see, you know, this part of the of the flower rather than the thimble shaped. In which case they'd be a lot harder to see. I think I can see them a lot easier when they still have some of their seeds attached. All right, moving on to the mint family, both Virginia mountain mint and narrow leaf mountain mint are great ones. The bees just love these. Um, characteristic of the mint family and a great giveaway, the stems are square. Um, and if you crush the plant, it smells like mint. And this smell dissipates as the season goes into winter, but it's a great way to identify plants in the mint family for a lot of the year. Um, the leaves are very uh, long and narrow, um, smooth edges. The flowers kind of form in a flat top um, uh, structure with terminal clusters on a, a cyme, which bloom from mid um, summer to late summer. And that's the part that really persists into winter. The cymes begin to dry and turn uh, brownish gray. I think they often have a bit of almost like a silvery look to them. Um, here, this looks a little bit more silvery, um, especially compared to the drab browns and tans in the surrounding vegetation. And if you tip them over, you can shake out some grain sized seeds that can be shaken out from the tubes. Um, they look like little black pieces of sand. So these persist in the winter. The leaves are completely gone. Here's a stem, um, but you can kind of see the opposite branching nature of it. Um, so the leaves are gone, but these cymes stick around for a long time. All right, and many of you are probably familiar with Monarda or wild bergamot. Another one in the stem, uh, mint family has that square stem. Um, and these kind of beautiful lavender flowers that the bees love. The leaves are very aromatic and toothed, um, but those leaves do not stick around in winter. Those leaves are again gone, and you just have that nice square stem, but that's uh, easy to identify that square stem. And even easier are the seed heads because they're this globular shaped, uh, or globular <laughs> shaped cluster uh, with the open-ended tubules from um, the flowers. And early on, again, they have the black seeds the size of sand grains that can be shaken out. And these seed heads persist through most of the winter and sometimes even into the next year. All right, the Laetra species or blazing stars, I kind of lumped all the Laetras together. Um, there are definitely different um, blazing star species that were the, the flower looks different, um, but they all have similar identifiers. The one right here is the uh, prairie blazing star, and probably the most distinguishing characteristic is um, this uh, very long terminal flower spike. Um, and they produce a very deep purple uh, flowers that have kind of this feathery look to them. Um, the leaves are very narrow, and they're a lot, they're usually a lot longer at the bottom of the stem. And as you ascend toward the flyer, flower spike, the leaves get a lot shorter and thinner. Um, the leaves have very smooth margins and are only slightly hairy. Um, when the plant is small, you can confuse it with horsetail, with common uh, agricultural weed, but the leaves are longer at the base and the leaves um, have that, you know, shorter, uh, shorter length as you go up the stem. So as horsetail and blazing star grow taller, you'll be able to easily tell the difference. Um, plus horsetail is a lot more hairy and a lighter green. And by winter, you can definitely tell the difference um, because of that flower spike, obviously. Um, it's a very dense, uh, fluffy spike <laughs> until it loses uh, its seeds that fly away. And then here, these spikes, um, I had to put down on the snow to kind of get a a better picture, but they're very thin spikes um, with just the remaining uh, kind of flower uh, uh, bract that's remaining on there. Um, they kind of lose their rigidity and can look a little bit bent and curved by the elements. Um, sometimes they fall over, but sometimes they're still standing. Here you can still see some of those long um, thin leaves attached. All right, on to some of those yellow flowers. Um, these are not as hard to identify in winter as you might think, and it might even help your ID skills to identify them correctly in the summer because you're not distracted by that similar looking big yellow flower that's so common in many of the later blooming asters and prairies. Um, 
This here is the oxy sunflower, or sometimes called false sunflower. And these have very distinctive opposite leaves. Um, they're ovate in shape, tooth, and arranged somewhat offsetting, ascending up the stem. You can kind of see them um, like this, then they kind of turn a little bit as they go up the stem, but they're always opposite. Um, oxy usually grows in clumps, three to four feet tall, and they're blooming kind of mid to late summer. And lucky for us, those leaves often persist into the winter. So um, you can still identify it. Um, yeah, they just, those leaves hang on. And then um, the, the seeds oftentimes get eaten by birds, but um, you can kind of see the, the flower head or the remaining, what used to be the flower head is still here, that cone. Um, it has a little bit more of like a gold hue to it. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, falls off or is eaten by birds and then it kind of leaves behind more of like a white dimple disc that persists, persists through the winter. Um, I'm thinking most people know this one, yellow cone flower, because it's so ubiquitous in prairie plantings. Um, and sometimes it can be a little overseeded, but it does have some great pollinator value, serving a diversity of native pollinators, like some of our really tiny bees and small butterflies. Um, it's a species that's easy to establish and it's not too picky in site conditions. Um, and the cone heads, of course, are very distinctive. The leaves are also that pinnate shape that are subdivided with, this, uh, with the deep lobes. Um, and then this one is very distinct in winter as the flower heads are usually standing tall and proud against the drab background or up against the sky loft, um, just like they're flowering. Um, in the summer, they kind of stick up above a lot of the other vegetation. Um, they have kind of a gray or brown color and look um, like an elongated uh, cylinder. Um, also, if you take the seeds and crush them in your hand, they have kind of like an anise smell. Um, and sometimes they do fall off. Um, here, you can kind of see a lot of the seeds have fallen off or been eaten. Um, and so then you kind of have this little grayish colored uh, spike or little sword at the top. So it's still distinctive as coneflower. And then uh, this is kind of a mixed bag. Sometimes the leaves fall off. Here I found a, an example where the leaves were still on. Um, so they're very dried up and curled, but you can imagine if you straighten them out, they have that nice pinnate lobed um, shape to them. Um, but oftentimes the leaves fall off on these. And so then you're kind of just left with these tall spikes in the air. Um, Black-eyed Susan is a really common flower, which occur occurs in your prairies, fields, open woodlands, more likely to grow on its own on roadsides. Um, and it's usually one of the first things to bloom in your newly established prairies. Uh, it's a very coarse and hairy plant and kind of short in stature, only about one to two and a half feet tall. Each stem produces a single flower um, of eight to 20 bright yellow uh, flowers, I should say, of the, the rays um, and the disc flower. That's the brown eye in the middle. Um, its leaves are alternate and feel very rough due to the stiff hairs. Um, I don't have my picture very big here. And here's the first year rosette because it is a, a biennial. So it blooms throughout the summer months. And oftentimes I've even seen the, um, the senest plant right next to blooming ones because depending on the timing and the weather sometimes black-eyed Susan kind of sometimes almost goes in waves of blooming I've noticed um sometimes you'll you know almost be August and you'll just have some that are still blooming <laughs> um so the seed cone becomes hard and turns grayish or dark brown when the seeds are ripe um sometimes um the flower heads are very distinguishable they get sometimes they have these uh little bracts at the end, sometimes they're gone. Um, oftentimes the leaves are still attached. They're that very, still very bristly and hairy. Um, and they have kind of like a silvery look to them, a very silvery or light gray hue. And so if you're um, standing, looking at a whole field, oftentimes you can kind of pick out, you know, once you have the search pattern for this and know what it looks like, you can kind of spot the color um, in different spots from afar. Um, and then this one is a little lesser known, uh, brown-eyed Susan, but this is a really great one because it blooms after black-eyed Susan. It's one of the, the latest blooming prairie species, um, and so that's really helpful for pollinators. Um, this is more of a short-lived perennial, and like I said, blooms right after black-eyed Susan. Um, the leaves are kind of more ovate-shaped or can be a little bit lancelet. Um, but they have very branching ready um, reddish hued stems and kind of the, the branching bushy nature of this plant is usually what gives it away. Um, 
and so Oh, and and they're they're quite large too. Like you might be walking along and kind of get to like almost like a, a little thicket of these. I mean, they can be four or five feet. Um, they love sunny areas, and they have kind of this like you know ditzy flower look to them because these flowers are only uh, a couple uh, inches across. And then in winter, you can see this bushy structure, um, and they're quite tall. They um, are very branching and look like little spritzes of copper colored cone heads all over. So they're a lot lighter in color than the, um, or kind of more of a golden color compared to the black eyed Susans. Um, and again, the structure, the, the leaves are pretty much all gone, but you can see this branching nature of it. Um, and then here's a nice comparison, the black eyed on the left and the brown eyed on the right. So they, they are actually quite distinctive. Um, all right, so I'm going to kind of speed through some of the Silphium species here, cup plant, prairie dock, rosin weed, um, all in the aster family. They um, have these big yellow flowers, just like sunflowers that track the sun. Um, the leaves are often opposite, feel like sandpaper, or the leaves are huge, have these huge basil leaves. These are kind of like our giants of the prairie, right? Um, and they continue to be so even in the winter, and they can and still be spotted. Um, here's that um uh that cup plant where the the leaves are kind of uh engulfing the stem there um the prairie dock even though these leaves are so close to the ground they still often persist into the winter and here you can see the the stems with the flowers um you know just their sheer height alone is kind of enough to identify them you can see them from a distance they almost look like little trees um, but oftentimes the the tough leaves make it through the winter and so you can still use the leaves to identify them um, stiff goldenrod is one of the easier goldenrods to identify because of its stiff stem and big soft leaves the leaves are alternate kind of a gray green color oval to oblong hairy on both sides um and the the leaves at the bottom are often much, much larger. Um, a stem is unbranched, very stiff, um, and blooms August through October. Um, and then in wintertime, the, the leaves oftentimes stick on. Um, you still see that alternate fashion, um, that texture you can kind of, if you're used to it in summer, the texture seems um, you know, very uh, reminiscent of it in, in winter too. Here, the um, pappas are still attached to the seeds. It kind of looks like a big, poofy, white, kind of a little bit more brown. Um, but oftentimes, uh, those float away, and then you're kind of left with just where the receptacle was um, of the seeds. And it kind of almost looks like little silver daisies or something. <laughs> kind of has this little silver daisy look to it um, through the winter. So these still stand pretty tall. This picture was just taken a couple of weeks ago. Those are easy to spot. Um, grass leaf goldenrod is easy to distinguish from the other goldenrods because of its flat top. Sometimes it's called a flat top aster and has a lot smaller flowers and these very narrow leaves. That's why it's called grass uh, leaf uh, goldenrod because it kind of looks like blades of grass. Um, it's one of the later blooming goldenrods. And here it is in winter. This one's a little bit harder to spot. It's a lot more delicate. Um, you know, maybe more likely to fall over, but it's also just kind of blends in, you know, to a lot of the vegetation around it. Um, oftentimes the leaf has, the leaves have all degraded. I didn't find any leaves attached to any of these, but you can kind of see that um, flat top of the flower structure. All right, and New England aster is one of our favorite asters. Um, it's really common. You'll find it growing in roadsides, likes a little bit more moist prairies. Um, and this has that clasping uh, uh, leaf arrangement. So the you can actually see the weave is kind of like hugging around the stem. Um, and then it produces kind of a, a profuse bloom of daisy-like flowers um, and different hues of purple uh, most often. And then sometimes they can be kind of like a pinkish or even a white color. And because they bloom so late in the season, oftentimes they kind of stick around a little bit longer. So in early winter, they still look like this. Um, their um, their uh, little tufts, their pappas there is kind of like a brownish color. And it actually makes the plant look kind of big, like they're, they're really noticeable like this. Um, but eventually those all kind of float away. And, um, and then you're left with something that looks more like this. Um, 
but the kind of bushy nature of it, and also a lot of times those leaves are still stuck on. So that clasping leaf um, arrangement, you can still tell to identify it as New England aster. Um, and honestly, there are a lot of asters. Um, I can't ID all those little white ones, those heath aster, frost aster. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, and so in winter, I can't ID them either. But there's a great group of really late blooming uh, white asters. And, um, you know, they're, they're still distinguishable in winter. You can still see them. Um, I think partly just because they're so late to bloom and so they just haven't had as much time to decompose or fall over. Sometimes some of the smaller ones will lodge, um, you know, and be covered in the snow or something. So like a year like this where we haven't had a ton of snow cover, they're more likely to be seen where other years they're probably going to lay more flat in the ground. Okay, getting to some common weeds just very quickly. Um, so I put Canada goldenrod in the weed section. Um, it does have some pollinator value. So it's one of those things that, you know, unless you plan to really control it or do something much better with your land, you know, you could just leave Canada goldenrod because there is some pollinator value to it. It's just when you have a pollinator planting, um, some more conservative species, you don't always want uh, Canada goldenrod because it can uh, be clonal and become quite oppressive and take over other plants. Um, so it's not the worst thing, but if it's a challenge you'd like to take on, it's it's nice to try and control it a little bit so that it doesn't uh, overtake. Um, so to in winter ID, the size won't give it away because you can have quite a range depending on you know what its um, light availability was, anywhere from like one to seven feet. Um, but their leaves are very narrow and kind of curl around the stem in winter, um, and they look very raggedy just like they do in summertime they kind of look like that in winter time too um and here the the flowers are very small they kind of have that once the uh, seeds have flown away the remaining structure kind of looks almost like black dots on um the remaining uh seed receptacle there um here's a great picture from Minnesota wildflowers, it has that kind of frosty view um here's on more of a drab day a lot of what um uh, Canada goldenrod looks like, but that kind of messy, um, you know, splayed out structure of the, the branching panicles there. Um, Colin Mullen literally sticks out like a sore thumb in winter. It has this really dark brown uh, flower spike. Uh, a lot of times the leaves stick around um, and they have, you know, kind of that soft, uh, well, now they're kind of crunchy, but um, you can imagine that they used to be more soft and, and um, and fuzzy in the in the summertime. Here's a picture of it, what it looks like in summer. But these are those big, huge, giant plants. Um, so they stick around all summer or all winter. Um, horseweed, sometimes called mare's tail, is a very common disturbance weed. It can get enormously high, reaching up to six or seven feet, in which case you would know that you did not keep up on your mowing maintenance. <laughs> um, and it is an annual and it does reseed easily, but um, although this one can be quite obnoxious because of how big it gets, it usually doesn't become too much of a problem as long as you're doing some mowing maintenance in the first years of establishment because um, it likes to take up, you know, the bare ground where the natives haven't uh, grown in yet. But regular mowing will keep this one in check. Um, the leaves, you know, it's kind of starts out looking like a blazing star early in the year, um, but then and the leaves kind of stick on. Um, throughout the winter. Um, wild carrot, this one's kind of easy to spot because it has that umble that kind of like folds in on itself a little bit. Um, this is a weedy uh, thing in a lot of pollinator plantings. It's biennial and um, it only makes a flower the second year. Um, the umble has umblets or <laughs> and so it's it's quite easy to distinguish and there's usually you know quite a few of them grouped together. Um, and then I'm going to move right along to early successional woody trees and shrubs. Um, so here's that one, um, th this is a, a PDF available through the, um, through UW Stevens Point, um, which is really handy if you're not, if you're new to these terms. So I'm just going to go over a couple of them really quick. Um, the terminal bud is something that you'll want to look at with uh, winter twig ID. The bud is formed at the tip of the twig. 
Um, and then bud scales is kind of like the scale-like structures that are modified leaves covering the bud during winter dormancy. And then lateral buds are something that you'll want to take note of. Um, those are the buds that form on the side of a twig, not the bud at the end of the twig. And then uh, leaf scars are sometimes uh, an important identifier. That's the scar left on the twig when the leaf falls. And then also lenticels, um, they're kind of like oftentimes look kind of like dotted white. They're kind of like a corky area or speckled area that's actually used as like a breathing pore for the plant. All right, so box elder, um, I had to put in here because it's it grows so fast and it often pops up, kind of almost looks like some people will mistake it as a weed, but um, here's a young box elder. And it's kind of the black sheep of the maple genus and many people don't even realize that it is actually a maple. It's an early successional tree that often finds its way um, by wind seed, um, by, by wind seed dispersal. Um, and you can kind of see, um, here's a, a large plant and then nearby you'll have the small ones. Um, so if you have box elder in the surrounding landscape, it's very likely that you'll have them popping up in your pollinator planting or your, your prairie. Um, and then here for the twig ID, um, the most distinguishing characteristics are the waxy purple on the new growth. Um, and then also with box elder, you have the attached samaras that kind of stick on over the winter. Um, but the buds are kind of have this hairy or white pubescent and are very blunt in shape. And so that's kind of the, and here's, um, this picture is from Minnesota Wildflowers, a much nicer picture for you to see those features. And then here they are out in the field. Um, then I wanted to cover three different dogwoods today. So um, the first species we'll start with is the one that's probably the most common or the most noticeable at least is the red osier dogwood. So here in a, a newer prairie planting, it's you know all kind of the brownish drab grasses, but you have this bright red sticking out. Um, so winter is a really good time to look for um, shrubby growth like this. Um, you can easily recognize it even driving at highway speeds because of that um, bright crayon red color. Um, so the branches have kind of a distinctive white quirky lenticels that are noticeable here in the picture. Um, and the winter buds are, pu are pubescent um, and have uh, two scales. And if you increase your fire frequency, that'll help kind of phase out this native, it'll help control it. Um, but with dogwoods, you know, it's a native dogwood and it does have wildlife value. And so um, if you're actually trying to keep it around, it's really nice for fence rows, you know, or for your edges. Um, you can actually promote its growth by cutting it once in a while, and then it kind of sends up more shoots. So you can reinvigorate old stands of dogwood um, for bird habitat. And it also has pollinator value because it does have a really nice white flower. So, um, you know, depending what your goals are, a lot of times people feel inclined to get rid of their shrubs. Um, or if you're a CRP and have to control woody, woody growth, um, it's good to spot and control it, um, know where, uh, what your management plans are, but it is also a really good one to, to keep on the edges or allow some of it to grow because it does have some good wildlife value. Um, silky dogwood is found in similar habitats to red osier dogwood and can be confused, but it's um, more likely to be in wet sites. Um, the stems are dark red or burgundy and have fine hairs on kind of more of the newer tissues. The branches are very dark red with kind of striped tan um, and can age into more of like a completely tan color. So here you can kind of see the two colors mixed together. Um, the branching is opposite and the, bubs, the buds are very densely hairy. The terminal buds are kind of conical um, and the lateral buds are very oppressed. That means it's kind of like um, squished onto the, the twig. Um, if you're ever confused as to which dogwood you're looking at, a red osier or silky, you can uh, look at the pith. That's kind of the quickest way. So on the left, you have silky. Here's the silky dogwood. And on the, uh, the right, you have the red osier. Um, the brown foamy pith is what gives the silky dogwood away compared to the red osier dogwood. Um, and then gray dogwood comes up a lot in um, prairies and pollinator plantings. Um, and here is kind of a good example, a good way to determine dogwoods is that it um, always kind of widens a little bit right before the bud. So the twig is rather thin, but then it widens just a little bit before um, the bud. Um, but the buds are opposite and have kind of hard to see silky hair 
and two to four bud scales. Um, and they form kind of like dense dome uh, shaped clonal thickets and they spread through disturbance by its root system. Um, so you can see these shrub clones from a distance as the older will, will have kind of like a gray hue to them. Um, the new branches or terminal ends will have more of a brown or orange color. All right, and black locust. Um, black locust uh, is native more south of here. Um, here, it's not it's not native to Wisconsin. So if you have black locust, you have a problem because it is a clonal tree. Um, it's out of native range and um, it can really take over. Um, and it also um, is a nitrogen fixer, so it kind of changes the soil around it. So um, the roots are extensive and they will sucker and sprout, um, like you can see in this photo here. Um, this is coming from the parent tree. Um, and so you can, um, you can, I don't have a good bud picture here, but um, these spikes are kind of what give it away. Um, you might want to confuse it with prickly ash, uh, which is a native, but the black locust has very new uh, brown growth, whereas the prickly ash is quite gray and has more of like a noticeable red velvet bud. And the thorns of black locust are a lot more intimidating compared to those of prickly ash. Okay, and moving right along to some of our invasives. So probably a lot of you are not new to common buckthorn, um, but winter time is a great time to assess um, your buckthorn problem and kind of plan for management. And it's a great time to flag um, just because you can easily identify buckthorn um, in the winter. So the, um, the bark will have kind of a brown to gray metallic color. Stems will be kind of tipped with needle-like thorns instead of the uh, terminal buds. Um, and they have this kind of like opposite or it's almost more like sub opposite because it's not quite directly opposite. It's they call it sub opposite. They're just slightly offset buds. Um, but the buds themselves are deep purple to brown color and are armored with kind of hairless scales. Um, here's more of a close up of it um, and that kind of metallic look to the buckthorn bark and very obvious lenticels. Here's that those purple offset um, uh, buds and you know, some of the trees will have the dark black fruit on them. Um, here's a really nice comparison um, the Minnesota Wildflowers website had. Um, sometimes buckthorn in winter can be confused with cherry, with black cherry or choke cherry. So if you're planning to control buckthorn, please just make sure that you're not accidentally cutting down your cherry trees. <laughs> um, so you can definitely tell the difference. Here's that thorn. Um, the, the cherry is a lot more brown, has no thorns, and is alternate and has this kind of a dark tip on the buds. Um, and another way to tell is to scratch the bark. Buckthorn has an orange color. The cherry has kind of a green color underneath. Um, and here's a comparison of the gray dogwood to buckthorn. Um, you can tell the buds, once you have them next to each other, they look completely different. Um, from a distance here, this is a whole bunch of those kind of whips of uh, a buckthorn encroaching and um, there are actually some gray dogwood in here and so um, in the winter if you're um, treating your buckthorn you know make sure you flag your gray dogwood it's nice to keep some native plant instead of just you know starting with the blank slate if you're controlling your buckthorn keeping that those dogwoods around would be really helpful um, autumn olive is very aggressive and will dominate the landscape if it's left unchecked the buds are alternate and easy to identify at a distance because the plant is often densely suckering from the base and has kind of like a copper to brown indeterminate new growth, which are like the water sprouts, um, which is very well contrasted to the older gray branches. Um, the young stems are completely covered with copper scales, and so that's uh, very distinguishable. And the buds have the same color and texture and appear without uh, the typical armored scale. And the buds are often uh, stalked. They have a little kind of like stalk to them. Um, and the leaves sometimes are retained into the winter and have a striking silver underside. Um, and they have some thorns on the new growth. <laughs> All right. And a lot of you are probably familiar with garlic mustard dames rocket, believe it or not. Oftentimes you can see them in winter um, because they had those seed pods with those single row of seeds. And so once those drop, oftentimes you're kind of left with this skeleton looking of um, the plant. So I was kind of surprised once you start looking, you can actually see garlic mustard, dames rocket still standing through the winter. Um, 
Wild parsnip has that umbel of flowers. They can be quite tall, so they're easy to distinguish um, from like your native like uh, golden Alexander. Um, and this is a good time to kind of spot, you know, where these plants are to know uh, where you should have been mowing in the summer. And then uh, reed canary grass is pretty common. This is a good one to always look out for. Winter is kind of a good time um, to look for it. it. It tends to lodge under the snow very easily compared to the native C4 grasses, which usually stand up pretty straight throughout the whole winter. Um, the that distinctive long ligule of reed canary grass is still usually somewhat visible. Um, but because it's clonal, you can kind of see it in monocultures and have that kind of golden hue. And so sometimes you can even recognize it from an aerial photo if you know what you're looking for. Okay, so sorry that was such a breeze through so many species. I'm trying to get through a lot. Um, I want to have a few quick words about site assessment for pollinators. Um, so thinking just about what pollinators need before you think about site assessment, just thinking what they actually need. Of course, native plants are going to be the best for nutrition. And the big thing we always drive home is to have um, something that's flowering uh, throughout the entire growing season. So a lot of our prairies, it's hard to source um, forbs that are really early blooming like prairie smoke. And so relying in early spring on flowering trees and shrubs are sometimes the only flowering um, things, the only sources of nectar for some of our early pollinators. So having a diversity in your landscape of those flowering trees and shrubs, um, and then in um, having blooms throughout the entire season, we like to say have at least three blooms in um, a diversity of plants in spring, early summer, late summer, and in fall. Um, and when we're thinking about nesting and shelter, um, wintertime is a really good time to think about what sort of overwintering sites your pollinators have. Um, our honeybee hives are an example of what honeybees need, but that's not representative at all of what most of our native bees need. 90% um, of our bee species are solitary. And of that, 70% are ground nesting and 30% are cavity nesting. So when you think of how many bees that is, how many species, you know, where do they all go in winter? Well, these are some of their uh, winter hideouts, you know, uh, in the ground, um, different cavities in the wood, um, pithy, pithy stems, um, leaf litter, brush piles, down logs, bare patches of soil. These are all really excellent overwintering sites and then also nesting sites for pollinators. So winter is a very good time to remind yourself, you know, if we're always so drawn to the blooms, thinking about our plant diversity, that all that's extremely important. But don't forget that if you want your pollinators to stay and not just be passing through, you want to have um, overwintering sites for them. Um, all right, so thinking about your establishment and your success in the first couple of years, um, just some really general guidelines here. Um, and of course, it depends on the species you're using and the site you have, but um, just in general, you want to have about um, 0.25 to 1 native seedlings per square foot at the end of your establishment year. Um, these photos here are from the same site. Here it is in the summertime. You can see a lot of that Black Eyed Susan. And then here in the wintertime, um, you can still see that black cut season there, but um, in the winter time, you can notice a lot more uh, bare ground. And so you want to make sure that just because it looks like this in winter, don't underestimate how dense it's going to be in the summertime. Um, you also want to check for un uh, unwanted species to inform your management decisions. Um, check the surrounding field edges to see what's there to make sure that you're not going to get any pesticide drift. And then, like I was just saying, checking for overwintering and nesting sites. Um, some bare ground is a good thing because that, you know, is a spot that some bees can find, uh, can dig their tunnels. Um, assessing some habitat for post-establishment phase, more, you know, past years two and three. Um, now is more the time to start looking at overlapping succession of your blooms to have all season long. And ideally, you would be, if you're really evaluating your site for pollinator, uh, for pollinators and their forage um, quality, you want to check your site about every two weeks because that way you can really check to see if there's something blooming all the time. 
Um, a successful pollinator planting will have no gaps in bloom and have at least three different species blooming at any time. So, and thinking about a diversity of color, of different flower types, different plant families. Um, I usually think of a, a gap in bloom time as if you have less than 10% of your cover is blooming for more than two weeks. Um, and that's because if you have that much of a gap in bloom, you will have pollinators that will decide that there's not enough forage there, not enough nectar pollen that it will move on to a different site. Um, so you don't want to have any gaps in bloom. So, um, and winter is a great time to, um, obviously things aren't blooming, but it's a good time to check for species that you might not have seen otherwise when you're thinking about um, like the milkweeds uh, for host plants. Um, here's a site of more of a wet site. There's a lot of joe pie and bone set here. And I found a few swamp milkweed. Then here in winter time, you know, looks like a lot of grasses have lodged and you can see the cattail. But I was actually able to find a whole bunch of swamp milkweed that I did not see during the summertime. So depending on when you're out there to check, you know, if you're not catching things quite in the sweet spot for when it's blooming, there's some of these species that it's easier to cruise for in winter time and find them. Um, and then, of course, like I said, looking for um, uh, the nesting sites to support bee habitat. Are there pithy stems? Are there some down uh, woody debris? Is there, you know, a brush pile, some ample leaf pile? Um, you know, what are the goals of your habitat? Are you are you uh, trying to intend your habitat for monarch? Then your goal is to have about 500 stems of uh, milkweed per acre or about 35% cover of nectarine forbs to support monarchs. Um, so those are a lot of things to consider um, during the winter to think about if you can amend your soil mix with certain species to fill in some of those uh, bloom times or if you need more milkweed stems. Um, and then planning ahead of, for management, um, you also wanna think about what sort of um, uh, technical and financial resources are available to you. I know a lot of you here today are NRCS, so you don't need to know this, but there's also a lot of landowners um, on the webinar today. So I want to make sure you're aware of um, the different programs through NRCS. They, NRCS just announced a new program deadline for the Conservation Stewardship Program. Um, and there are a lot of different conservation practices through farm bill programs that support pollinators. So um, if you're interested in doing more pollinator habitat or improving the habitat you have, I highly encourage you to contact your USDA service center um, and talk to your uh, local NRCS or uh, partner staff about how you can improve your pollinator habitat. All right, um, I think I've reached the end here. So. If we still have some time left, we can take some questions. And I also want to mention that you should feel free to email me. Here's my email. Um, if you have any questions regarding today's material or if you would like any support with pollinator habitat planning, um, or if you'd like any help with some of your outreach events to promote pollinator habitat to landowners, you're uh, more than welcome to contact me. Okay, thank you for that presentation, Laura. Um, yes, and everybody, please put in the chat if you have any questions, um, and we'd be happy I, to, an to get them answered. We have a few minutes um, available for that. So feel free to just pop something in the chat. Okay, it looks like we first of all had a thank you um, and a very good and informative presentation. Um, and then we have another um, question, which is in general, when does the overwintering period end for most pollinators? Um, yeah, it depends. Um, it's hard to say for most pollinators because there is really a, a big range of when pollinators wake up. Um, so some of our earliest uh, queens, our queen bumblebees, sometimes will emerge as early as uh, late March or April, depending on the year. Um, some people have, you know, noticed that they're out cruising, you know, when there's even still sometimes patches of snow on the ground. Um, so some of our queen bumblebees are out very early. 
And that's why the like willows are salix um, are really important for uh, forage for our earliest pollinators. That's one of the earliest blooming things in Wisconsin. Um, and then, so yeah, anytime, you know, as soon as things are starting to thaw, you, you have pollinators waking up and there's some native bees that maybe don't wake up until June or July, and then they have a very short nesting and foraging season. Um, so I can't say there's really a typical time. I mean, I would say the majority of them probably wake up or, you know, butterflies are out, you know, in spring, probably May, June is when most of them start coming out. Um, bee colonies are usually, uh, the largest, you know, in the later part of the uh, summer when they need the most amount of resources because there's a lot more of them. In the early spring, there's usually just a queen out foraging. Um, but as the season goes on, you have to support a much larger population. Um, but yeah, it's it's a quite quite a big range. I would say anywhere from, you know, end, end of March, April, all the way through some of our latest queens don't tuck in for winter until the very end of like October. Okay, uh, we have another, I'm just going to ask one of the quick questions is what does lodging of grass mean? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't define that term. So um, grassing, grass that's lodging just means that it's fallen over. Um, and so wind, um, rain, snow, anything that's heavy has enough pressure on it. So lodging is when it kind of falls over and stays over. Um, you know, if you have a high wind, it might blow, but then stand back up. But lodging is when there's actually kind of like a, a crimp in the plant stem. And so then it stays down for the rest of the year. Um, you can have lodging in green plants, sometimes like really thick stands of like switchgrass is something that lodges really easily. Um, if you have really thick, dense, heavy plants, they'll lodge. Um, but more often we see the lodging in winter after, you know, snow cover, things like that. And then you kind of get that matted uh, vegetation on the ground. Thank you. Um, does the seed viability on the plant uh, go down during the winter? Um, that's a good question. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, these native plants are, you know, within one year, I would say no. Um, I mean, in fact, a lot of the seeds need to be out during the winter. Um, they need that temperature, the scarification, the temperature fl fluctuation in order to germinate. Um, as far as, you know, taking the seeds in for a part of the winter and then putting them back out for stratification, I don't know if anyone's looked into that. I'm not familiar with any studies on that, but I would say for the most part, you know, I don't think it can go down significantly. I would say if you leave your seeds out you're more likely to get you know wildlife to eat the seeds so you might have you know less germination or recruitment just because of that reason because um, animals are eating the seeds but I don't know about actual you know the viability of the seed I would think within one year it'll be pretty similar and I mean native plants are notorious too for some you know if they get buried in the soil I mean sometimes they're still good like 10 years later for some of the species so native plants are are pretty tough okay and then we have one last question um and I'm not sure I completely understand it so I'm just going to read it out so how manage pollinator and it says HAB, I'm not sure if that's an acronym for something. Um, when have Brome um, or Brome, B-R-O-M-E, encroaching the site? Okay, so like how to manage the pollinator habitat when you have Brome, uh, maybe? Uh, brome grass. So, so yeah, Brome grass is, um, yeah, cool season grass. Um, it used to be part of pasture. Um, that's kind of a... A difficult one to deal with. Um, so yeah, brome grass, ugh, that's a bad one um, to deal with. You burning at the right time can help uh, take care of it. Sometimes you can uh, keep doing it over and over again. Um, but I've heard a lot of managers just um, resort to herbicide because it can be very difficult to deal with. Smothering is a good way sometimes. Um, sometimes there are tough ones if you want to stay away from uh, any herbicide smothering it. Um, is a good way to deal with it. Um, but yeah, smooth brome is not a fun one. 
Okay, and then we have another one that um, is coming from somebody who joined the meeting a little late and is just wondering where the pollinator native plant booklets are available. And I'll say one note of we will be sharing the presentation. So I know Laura had quite a few of um, options available, well, uh, options to choose from. So you'll be able to peruse them more fully. Um, but Laura, if you have like another specific answer or recommendation, feel free to jump in. Yeah, no, you you got it right, Isabel. I mean, the um, I think the one I you're maybe they're asking about is that PDF about the seedling um, mm -hmm. and uh, seeding evaluation guide, um, and that I had the the website um, on the top part of the slide, just above that uh, pamphlet. Um, it's through the I think the, I've seen it different places. Um, uh, on the internet, um, the link that I had was from uh, the Iowa Highway Department, I think, IDOT. Um, so that's the link that I have, but I've also seen it other places too. Okay. Um, I think this is going to be our one last question that we have before we close everything up, just for time-wise. Um, but somebody asked, is it safe to say that a fair amount or even a majority of seed dispersal occurs into the winter when windy, dry conditions persists, especially with many native asters. Yeah, I think that's you know a pretty safe assumption. Um, honestly, I've never you know tracked it that closely, but um, yeah, I mean some of those asters, they'll you'll see their you know their fluffy um, seed heads there stick around for quite a while, and then all of a sudden one day they're kind of gone. Um, <clears throat> once in a while, it's a little bit more slow and gradual, but it does kind of seem like, you know, I mean, honestly, I've never tracked it that closely, but it does seem like, you know, one day they're there and then kind of one day they're not. So, <laughs> um, I would say that's, that's relatively safe assumption. Okay. Well, just so you know, there's been many other thank yous and great presentations throughout the chat. So thank you again, Laura, for doing such an amazing, um, job on it. And just as a reminder to everybody, I will be sending out a link to the recording along with the um, presentation and if there's any other follow up we have. And that email will be coming out sometime later this week. So uh, keep an eye out for it. But in the meantime, stay warm and stay safe in this winter storm, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for tuning in.